Good morning, everybody, and welcome to CER's webinar on distribution system operators, development plans, and network planning. I'm very happy to see that there are quite a few attendees participating in this webinar, so you are very welcome. Uh, I am Veli Pekasayo. I'm representing the distribution system working group within the Council of European Energy Regulators. So we have a quite interesting day or day or webinar ahead of us and we will have some discussion on, on different uh, European countries on, on the development plans and network planning issues. Of course these development plans have been collected in some countries already in Europe but the majority of the countries have not been collecting these development plans so there's a of course new legislation coming the directive is, is already in place and our EU countries are now implementing the legislation, so we will have a new legislation stating that the distribution system operators will have to provide uh, these plans uh, biannually and they will be published so there will be more transparency between the consumers and, and distribution system operators. And of course, these will provide more information how the network develops for the uh, other stakeholders as well, for example, the, uh, the system. Uh, storage service providers, for example, and of course, different uh, demand response stakeholders. Of course, we will have something to learn as well here, because this is something new for most of, most of us as regulators. We will have new tasks to deal with, on how the development plans will be collected, what kind of information we need, how we will publish them and make sure that all the plans are according to the legislation. So this is something that we will uh, discuss today. We will enhance the issues related to common practices, which we already have in place. We have two presenters, uh, one from the uh, regulator side, another one from the DSO side. So first we have uh, <coughs> Sorge Esteves from the Portuguese regulator. He will, he's the head of uh, infrastructure and network divisions, division, and he will tell us how the regulator has been dealing with these uh, development plans so far. Uh, then we will have a DSO view uh, by Jorma Müllemäki. He's a senior vice president and deputy CEO from the uh, distribution company in Finland, uh, Elenia. And then we also have a representative from the commission. Marian Malafose will tell us uh, more about the cleanest package and how the, the development plans are uh, designed in that that view as well and then of course we will have a panel uh, which will be which will, which will discuss the uh, sort of challenges which we have and advantage perhaps which we will learn why by, by using these development plans according to clean energy package and of course, you can post questions uh, while we have these uh, presentations and discussions in the panel. And in the end, we will discuss uh, these questions and we will try to do our best to answer, answer your questions. So with that, I think we should start the presentations. Perhaps George could now start his presentation, please. Thank you. Good morning, good morning all. Thank you very much, Veli Pekka. Thank you for the organizing of uh, this very actual workshop. I believe the topic is very important and even uh, all, all this sharing of experiences between all of us and discussion that is necessary justify the importance of this workshop today. From, from myself and from us, the National Regulatory Authority from Portugal, thank you very much for the invitation and for this opportunity for us to be able to present our case. Um, the key advantage that we have, uh, we have already from the past uh, a process in the internal law, uh, the law that uh, defines the rules for the electric sector. We have already this um, procedure of doing every two years a discussion and approval process around the, 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 the national electricity high voltage and medium voltage distribution network uh, plan. 
So we have already since 2014 um, this procedure and we have already applied it for four times for electricity uh, and also for gas. Uh, in the, this is done during the even years because during the hot years we do it for the electricity transmission network and for the natural gas transmission network and storage facility in LDNG terminal. So we have already this process a little well working because several times it was done. And we have some conclusions to share. Um, this, this slide shows, sorry. Uh, oops. This slide shows in a, a figure all the process is a very long process during almost uh, nine months. We at least we discussed the topic. The, this is applied and this example that we are this year applying it because this is a, a, a moment. The, the plan will be done for the next plan will be done for 21 till 25. Our network operator for high, high voltage and medium voltage presented um, is network uh, is draft for net, the network development plan in the distribution. Uh, we began to prepare uh, the public consultation. We have in our procedure 22 days for the National Regulatory Authority to prepare this public consultation in long sheet. After this public consultation is developed and open during 30 days, and after that we receive comments for different stakeholders. After that, we have 22 days, uh, this is working days, for preparing a public consultation report. And this is published and uh, distributed to the, the TSO, to the, our ministry and the, the representative, the Ação Geral de Energia, that is the, the body from the ministry that works in the topics of energy. And, they, and after that, we have 30 days for preparing uh, opinions these opinions from the regulator, from the TSO and from the ministry are given to the network operator that after collecting all the comments received, prepare a draft final version of the plan. This is all, to, all collected by the ministry and is submitted for approval to the ministry and uh, that also has the, uh, um, uh, an opinion from the, uh, from the Portuguese parliament. So it's a very transparent process with several different steps uh, and a long process. This probably is, the, but for sure we are able to uh, to be uh, able to involve both people. This slide that will you will receive is a little explanation of slide three, but uh, I jump now for this other topic that I consider very important and I will want to emphasize. The importance of this consult public consultation is the stakeholder participation and the deeply possibility that we are able to do and our experiences show this is very useful. For instance, the stakeholder opinions are of paramount importance for the, all this planning process because during this time and with comments that we receive, the regulator can be sure of what are the balanced opinions that we must give in order to correct the necessary conditions. This is a, a very important aspect. And also in the structure of affairs, we have a tariffs council and an advisory council involving representatives of all the different society sectors. And with this, uh, and it's very interesting to see during these 10, 15 years uh, that we are testing this process, we saw um, a learning procedure from all the stakeholders about the importance uh, of these procedures and their involvement always more deeply for one time for the other. This supports in a, a better, so in a better, in a deeper, um, in a deeper procedure, our opinions and give the support that our opinions being almost impositive because it's clear that it, it shows the balance, the vision about what all the society consumers and network users and also network operator's interest that presents. I believe this, a more robust opinion coming from the regulator gives the possibility of the, uh, the plan after be after approved, be accepted for all, be transparent in this decision 
and be a balanced one. Here I can show you in this slide um, what uh, we, uh, an example, the example of the, the, the national distribution plan that at this moment is in public consultation. Uh, typically, and this is a long process, as, you, as I said, we have a, a several loops of this process. We were able to, to agree with network operators about the relevant content this uh, national distribution plans must have. Basically, and think, uh, looking for the, the one that is in public consultation, this is divi dividing nine main topics, the planning and security standards and criteria that are developed, the evolution of the lead city consumption, network characterization, and capacity and data for capacity for new generation connection, that is today a very important topic. What are the objectives and the planning strategy? today centered in the logic of energy transition and network expansion, network uptake control and new services, the problem of network resilience. Um, after the main strategic vectors of the investment that the operator uh, presents, security of supply, quality of supply, network efficiency, operational efficiency, access to new services. The importance of in the investment of the renewal and the refurbishment of uh, the existing network assets. Also a problem that we have, and I believe in almost all countries, about the network resilience. We are discussing a lot of topics about that because some problems that we have are related to that. And after the problem, all the new vision about smart grids, risk analysis. All these give a, a plan that have a total of uh, 1,000 million euros for the next five years of investment and also the network operator show the network tariffs impact assessment from this point of view. This is supported in 11 annexes with different data, with different studies from the consultants from the city. And, in this, and also a very important aspect, we present, they present as another 72 different investment project sheets with a lot of details about each one of the main uh, projects that they consider of investment. In this slide, I show you, uh, this is not easy. Let's see if this is work better, no. Okay, okay, the detail. I have difficulties now. Uh, last few, next. Okay, I thank here, okay. Um, here, um, I show an example of one of the projects. Uh, it is in Portuguese, sorry, but the plan is uh, discussed at national level. Uh, but uh, in this first topic, is uh, the, the, this specific investment program is presenting uh, this, the, the sheet about network expansion. We are speaking about a cost of two, two, two million uh, at two, two million uh, um, uh, euros. Um, these show the expected technical benefits. Uh, these show the risk of power not guaranteed in this uh, we are discussing, the cost of the investment, the spent economic investment, the benefits. Uh, this in this in the middle we show what uh, they show, what uh, is the project description, what were the alternative study uh, solutions, and why the, a, a certain alternative was selected. So for, they repeat for each one of the 172 different projects they consider mainly, and this is completely transparent and put in analysis for all people involved. This allows that from a broader vision, also for local, it can be analyzed. Um, however, all of this is not completely in, in line because uh, in Portugal, we have one uh, high voltage and medium voltage distribution network in, in Portugal mainland, that is a national concession that is operated by only one network operator that presents this plan that we discussed. However, in complement, we have also a, a low voltage distribution network that 
that is divided into 278 municipal concessions with their specific investments not being considered at this national development plan. However, we, when we analyze the, the European law that it was published last year, we understand that we must this, analyze all this together. So, in our reasoning, in the topic that we must discuss, uh, are even knowing that the, the plan that is presented by the high voltage, medium voltage distribution operator uh, is only related to this, it's important to emphasize that uh, the, the interconnection point between middle voltage and low voltage are very important and we are even in that situation making a uh, some aspect, probably the major aspect of the low voltage planning. So we can consider that a major aspect of the low voltage planning is already included in this network development plan. We must discuss it, but uh, I believe that uh, one topic that is important is already analyzed in this process, because there are a lot of cooperation in this preparation of this plan between the low voltage uh, operators and the, the medium voltage operators in this process. Also, another aspect that is specific for Portugal, the high voltage medium voltage network operator is the responsible for data collection and treatment. He works at the data aggregator. Uh, this data aggregator coming from smart or traditional meters in the several levels of distribution networks facilitates the inclusion of the, in the national development plan of all the strategic points in investment topics of smart grids, optimized distribution grid dispatch and local flexible markets. So, we also, we believe that with some uh, improvements, this national development plan can be aligned with the objectives of the, the European regulation. So, we need to, better, to assure a better integration between the high voltage and medium voltage uh, networks uh, and with the low voltage network development planning. Uh, in order to perspectivize that national development plan that we are now developing represents a real integrated distribution network development and investment plan for all the country. And probably there are recasting, the needs of some recasting in national law in order to have this in line with the, the recent evolution of the European legislative. Also, it's important to assure that coordination between the high voltage and medium voltage network operator is well done with low voltage only networks the operators. Uh, in Portugal, this is easily for 99% of the network because in for the 99% of the, 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 the network, low voltage network is operated by the same, but we have also 10 little um, low voltage only networks operators that must we must assure this coordination. We believe that this works, but it's something that must be emphasized. In another perspective, oops, um, for challenges, and I believe that this is our case, but we know, and this is a perspective from the past, but it is important also to, to emphasize that uh, the challenge for the future that the directive from European Union published under the uh, clean energy package give us challenges very important in the perspective of all the um, evolution needs and distribution networks needs to be very well involved in this process, assuring the energy transition, the decarbonization, the digitalization and the decentralization of goals. Uh, these technological developments related to these three topics will impose uh, that uh, uh, available electrical distributed resources like photovoltaic uh, generator distributed uh, facilities and all other re uh, renewable energy sources generation. The self-generation that is also a very important topic that we must consider and put in the planning all the developments and the, the availability of storage distributed for all the network, all the consequences of the electric vehicle charging must be better considered on this because this will be a completely different process that could allow and will allow to have new long-term and medium-term and short-term flexibility services that can be provided by other participants in the market, can allow a participant from the side of demand and this 
are really new challenges that we must be facing. But important now is to be able to convert these new challenges in, into new opportunities. And I believe this is the reason because this CR webinar on the DCO uh, DSO planning is very important. And thank you for being, having this initiative. Thank you very much. Well, Ipeca, I finished my presentation. All right. Uh, I'm not sure if Elepeka will say something, or should I continue right away? All right. So I will. Yeah. All right. Are there some questions? Or head. Sorry about that. I had a bit of a <laughs> technical issue here. Thank you, sir, for your presentation. And I think we have some time to to address a couple of questions for Sorse before or before Jorma will start. So I. I can, I can, can you see them, George, you know, the, the questions? They should be on the chat. Yes, good. Please, go ahead. Um, okay. Some questions about uh, technicalities. It, it will be presented, uh, the presentation will be available after workshop. I believe that the Secretariat will assure that. Um, we have a question from Andra Banea. Um, uh, does ERS consider flexibility options using geared resources? Okay. Um, for our perspective, this is, will be a very important topic in the future. We must analyze this. This clear what I presented was the logic that is here related to the past and a, a more traditional view. We must now to be able to understand that we are in a process of transition, an energy transition, but is also a transition of mindset. I believe this is very important and, and, and the transition in the models. At this moment, we have not, not markets for flexibility if you don't consider only the balancing central, uh, global, national um, market. We must now be able to understand what are the real advantage of these flexibility services? Who could provide them? And I believe that is important, the participation of all demand and the, the distributed resources that will appear with the storage and with PV. But this is really something that is now balancing. In our view, from the National Regulatory Authority from Portugal, we are very open mind to begin to introduce this in the process. Till today, these do not exist, but it's obvious that for us this will happen and this is very important and the only way to assure the, the, the challenge that we have to create a very completely different new based in renewals electric system. I don't know if I am able to, un, 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 uh, to answer to Andra, but uh, uh, also we put a, a question. What is the voltage limit between medium voltage and low voltage in Portugal? The, the, um, the low voltage is under, the, by definition, under 1000 volts, but for instance, is the city phase 400 volts of at the European level, it's only low voltage uh, network. Medium voltage is the, the, the voltage between 1000 uh, volts and 60,000 volts. Okay, 60,000 volts, yes. These are the two questions that I have in the in the in the chat. I don't know, Valley Pekka. Yes, thank you, George. I think we can now move on. Thank you for your presentation very much. And please, Jorma, uh, stage is yours. Okay, thank you, Valley Pekka, and uh, good morning to everyone. 
Jora Mylmäki from Elenia in Finland. I'm the senior vice president and deputy CEO of Elenia, as Veli-Pekka mentioned in the beginning. So I will tell you the Elenia case study regarding uh, the current practice of uh, distribution network development plans. Uh, very shortly about uh, our business. Uh, so uh, we are the second largest distribution system operator here in Finland. Uh, our market share is approximately 12 percent. We have over 430,000 customers currently, and our network length is over 74,000 kilometers. We are clearly a rural uh, distribution company, so we have over 170 meters of uh, network lines per customer. We are, we are focusing a lot on sustainability and uh, quality, and we have uh, external certifications in place for our management system, such as asset management system, occupational health and safety management system, environmental management system, and information security management system as the latest uh, achievement. Our headquarter is located in Tampere, which is the biggest uh, inland uh, city in Can Scandinavia. Uh, Elenia is at the forefront of innovation. I can just mention some examples of what we have achieved in the past. We were actually the, the, or we were, yeah, the first uh, DSO in Finland to start to uh, install and roll out smart meters to our customers in the beginning of 2000. Uh, and and uh, now we are actually already considering and testing the next generation uh, rollout of smart meters, uh, which will take place in uh, 2021 uh, to and 2023. We have uh, invested a lot in uh, automation uh, in our overhead network and now lately also in uh, underground cable network. We have implemented several sophisticated automation solutions such as uh, automatic port location, isolation and power restoration in the whole uh, or entire network, uh, monitoring of low voltage network through smart meters, and we have also implemented uh, information services uh, uh, to our customers, uh, for example, audits map and uh, SMS service of uh, network outages. We have also uh, invested a lot in security of supply and uh, especially underground cable network. I will soon tell you more about that. And uh, as an innovative concept, I will also at the end of my presentation tell you a li little about our battery concept which we are testing now in distribution network together with Fortum, which is a Finnish energy company here in Finland. In Finland. If we take a look at the uh, DSO market in Finland, it's very fragmented. Uh, so first of all, Finland is a sparsely populated country. We have 5.5 million inhabitants and uh, over 338,000 square kilometers. Uh, there are altogether 77 uh, distribution system operators in total in Finland, and the same regulatory methods are applied for all the DSOs. Largest five DSOs have a combined market share of approximately 50%, and as mentioned, we are the second largest DSO in Finland. Uh, the Electric Market Act, or EMA, as I will later call it, was established in 1995. And the Energy Authority, which is the uh, national uh, regulator, is an entirely independent uh, regulator in Finland. Uh, now I move on to network development plans. And in Finland, uh, the focus of network development plans is on the security of supply measures in distribution network. In two, at, at the end of uh, 2011, there were two massive storms in Finland, uh, causing uh, long outages to, to several hundreds of uh, Finnish customers, even in the capital area of Finland, close to Helsinki. And uh, soon after those massive storms, uh, the Electricity Market Act was uh, amended and changed. Uh, so that uh, in 2013 uh, there were requirements uh, concerning uh, the, the DSO's uh, secret of supply and said, stating that uh, uh, power outages caused by storms or snow loads must not exceed six hours in zoned uh, urban areas 
and 36 hours in other areas, meaning rural areas. And there was a transition period uh, defined so that uh, by the end of 2019, 50% of the customers would be uh, supplied by a network which pulls the six hour and 36 hour targets. Uh, and then by the end of 2023, 75% of the customers and uh, the final deadline uh, is 2028 when 100% of the customers should be supplied by a network which pulls this requirement of six hour and 36 hour uh, uh, requirement. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, there was also a statement in the law that uh, DSOs need to define the measures on how to achieve the security of supply requirements in, in the network development plan, which needs to be updated and delivered to the energy authority every second year. And uh, for example, Elenia, we actually de delivered the first network development plan to the Energy Authority in 2014. A uh, little bit about the content of the network development plan uh, in, in Finland, and of course now focusing on, on Elenia uh, specifically. The Energy Authority, as the regulator, defines the requirements for the NDP content and uh, in our case, the NDP can be summarized as follows. First of all, uh, we express there the strategic approach in network development covering items such as uh, network design criteria and measures to fulfill the security of supply requirements, capabilities for the execution of network development, uh, cooperation with uh, other infrastructure operators such as the telecom operators, uh, operational model and capabilities for outage management and uh, major power disruptions, uh, specific measures which are needed and implemented regarding critical customer premises uh, in the network and exceptions for security supply targets due to local circumstances. There are lots of, for example, lakes in Finland and there are some tricky areas with islands and, and there may be some exceptions uh, for these uh, six hour uh, or 36 hour targets. Long-term plan is part of the network development plan, uh, current situation and achieved performance, uh, detailed plan for the current and following year and measures taken in the last two years. So the idea works so that there is always like the long-term plan and then there are specific uh, measures for the current and following year described as well as uh, the measures uh, which have been conducted and executed in the past two years. In our case, uh, the network development plan package is quite extensive. There are, uh, in addition to these, I would say, strategic and operational items, uh, 24 appendices which support the content and, and uh, uh, in a way, uh, create the background for the plan. Uh, about our strategic approach, uh, First of all, DSOs can freely choose the network development strategy to, me, to meet the EMA's requirements. Uh, in our case, uh, our long-term network development plan is based and defined so that uh, the 20, sorry, 75% uh, cabling rate by 2028 is the backbone for the secu security of supply. Uh, in Addition to that, network automation together with sophisticated uh, operational ITC, ICT systems is the additional enabler uh, for improving operational performance and outage time reduction in long term. Operational processes and preparedness capabilities for major power disruptions are of course also continuously improved together with external contractor partners. And here is an actual example of, of our devel development plan uh, in, in the picture. I mean, the bars show uh, customers covered by the quality requirements in average in our network. And then uh, the, the blue line tells uh, what is the low voltage level underground cabling rate, low voltage meaning 400 uh, volt. And then what is the underground cabling rate uh, in our medium voltage, so-called 20 kb uh, uh, network. And as you can see, in average, our target is to reach uh, the 75% underground cabling rate by 2028, which is the deadline for the transition period in the current Electricity Market Act. 
Uh, I mentioned that the, in, in the network development plan, there is also the comparison between uh, the performance and, and, and uh, original requirements of the EMA. So the DSO needs to, in a way, uh, prove that it has uh, fulfilled the requirements which, has, which have been set by the LSD Market Act and which have been defined by the DSO uh, by itself when it uh, submitted the previous network development plan two years ago. And here is uh, an extract of our figures uh, and, and uh, visualized uh, on, on, on the slide. So uh, here actually the uh, red line or pink line uh, defines or shows what is the average amount of uh, customers in, in, in such a network which uh, fulfills this uh, six hour target in zoned areas and 36 hour target in rural areas. Then uh, what comes to the zoned areas. So the Electric Market Act says that there must not be any outages longer than six hours in the zoned areas by 2028. So here with, with the black line, we are uh, following up that uh, uh, that requirement is met in the zoned areas. Uh, in 2019, our situation was so that 80.5% of our customers met the six hour target. And then the blue line uh, shows us uh, the amount of customers fulfilling this 36 hour target in rural areas. And in 2019, uh, over 50% of LNS customers fulfilled the 36 hour uh, quality demands of the EMA, which is exactly above the target of the EMA. So, so this just shows that uh, uh, it's in a way easier for our type of rural company to meet the requirements in zoned areas, because the zoned areas are typically areas where the substation, primary substation is, is located and we start the underground cabling and uh, network development from the primary substation and then moving towards the more rural areas uh, where we have uh, less customers and more overhead lines to, to, uh, to replace. Uh, shortly about our experiences and, and uh, benefits which we see with the network development plan. Uh, as mentioned, uh, security supply is the primary focus currently uh, in Finland uh, in the network development plans. And uh, we see that uh, the plans drive for professional and transparent asset management and long term network development. Uh, it requires systematic approach covering, for example, investments, maintenance, audit management, and resource capabilities. It also, uh, in a way, uh, encourages us to present various strategic choices for network development and uh, actual measures. It also then uh, encourages us to evaluate various alternatives to, to find the most uh, cost-efficient solution for the customer. Uh, it encourages us to analyze the performance and actions uh, to, to ensure prog progress of the plans and also provides, in a way, justification and transparency towards customers and stakeholders. There, there are also some specific requirements regarding critical customer premises so, so that uh, the DSOs need to identify the critical customer premises uh, in network development to make sure that there's a well-functioning society as a result of the network development. We also see that the level of granularity is correct and not too detailed in Finland in the network development plans. Uh, we, in a way, like the holistic approach. Uh, so uh, the other alternative could be that the, the approach is more a project or area specific. Uh, but knowing, for example, our geographical dimensions, we have a network, you know, if you think about uh, North-South dimensions, it's uh, 600 kilometers, and West-East uh, dimension is like 200 kilometers. So it's, it's clear that we need to have a holistic uh, bigger picture and then uh, start uh, from top and then uh, dig into details. Uh, in the Finnish system, uh, we also like the, the way how, how we, uh, in a way, set the targets for key performance indicators and then um, also uh, measure the, the outcome and uh, measure the achieved versus targeted uh, KPIs to ensure uh, good performance uh, in network development. 
Then if we sorted, uh, think about future expect expectations, uh, so we can see that, uh, I mean, in, in the future, we need to, in a way, accommodate uh, in Finland in the network development plans, both the Finnish uh, requirements, which are mainly coming from the security of supply perspective, but also then the European uh, requirements uh, regarding uh, the, the flexibility requirements uh, and, and evaluation of uh, various uh, investment alternatives. I've listed here some, some thoughts uh, on, on that. Uh, uh, it's clear that in Finland uh, there will be a requirement for cost-efficient uh, network development and the evaluation of alternative solutions for the security of supply. Uh, stakeholder engagement and consultation of relevant system users and, and also the, the Finnish TSO, Fingrid, will be there. But when saying that, it's also important for the future development that the details of network development and the consultation procedure will be kept as lean as possible. And, and we should, in a way, try to utilize uh, electric uh, and digital uh, me methods and tools to, to handle this uh, public consultation requirement. And of course, uh, from the European level, there will be, uh, from the clean energy package, requirements regarding connection of new generation capacity, new loads, including charging points for electric vehicle, transparency on, on the flexibility services needed, and, and uh, use of demand response, energy efficiency, energy storage, or other resources as an alternative to system expansion. I'm actually here referred to a publication of your electric. Uh, I'm the member of uh, your electrics uh, distribution market facilitation committee so i recommend you to take a look at uh, this uh, paper which has been published and there's also some useful information about the network development plans as the last item i would like to mention you have a picture uh, on the right hand side uh, we have actually developed quite unique uh, uh, distribution level uh, battery concept uh, so that in normal situations the batteries uh, used by Fortum uh, on the so-called uh, frequency controlled uh, normal reserve market and if there's an unexpected failure in the rural distribution network we can uh, order the capacity uh, to be used uh, to, to uh, store our customers so that uh, there are no outages uh, uh, seen by the customers uh, in, in a network fault situation. I will end up my uh, presentation here uh, and uh, wait maybe there's a, some time to, to answer some questions if, if needed. Yes, thank, thank you Jorma. Thank you Jorma very much. Uh, there are some questions I think you could answer perhaps two of them we have some couple minutes to, to do. Uh, I think the first one is number 10 that's that's for you or Elenia at least. Okay, now for some reason I, okay, now, now I see it. You said question number 10. Yes, 10. Yes. Nine is for both, so let's, let's take the 10. Yeah, currently, I mean, this uh, uh, battery concept is, is not a requirement from the, from the regulation point of view, but uh, as I mentioned uh, at the end, the, there is a most probably an anticipated uh, change in the Electricity Market Act so that we need to in a way evaluate uh, alternatives to develop uh, network cost efficiently uh, versus uh, traditional in investments and uh, this battery concept is one of those and uh, we have of course made our internal analysis on, on that but at the moment it's not a regulatory requirement but most probably it will be. Yes, then you're more perhaps number uh, 11. Yes, uh, question about uh, electric vehicles and, and the photovoltaic uh, on DSO planning in Finland. Uh, I would say that in, in, in our network there are more than 5,000 uh, PV installations, I mean rooftop in installations at the moment. The, the impact of those is quite uh, small because Finland has very strong uh, distribution network because we have electric saunas, traditionally lots of electrical heating long distances, so the network is strong. We don't currently see any problems with P 
PVs or even EVs at the moment, but there will be some, let's say, uh, local con congestions which we need to handle. But all in all, the situation is good in Finland because, because of strong distribution networks. Thank you, Jorma. Now we have to move on. So next we have Marian Thank you. from the DG Energy Unit uh, B3. She's a policy officer there. Please, floor is, floor is yours. Thanks. Thank you very much. I hope you can all hear me well. Um, so thank you for the invitation and also for the interesting presentation. And I very much look forward to uh, the debate uh, afterwards. So as a starting point of my presentation, you can move to the next slide. Um, I would like to explain a bit why we presented the clean energy package and you all know that with the clean energy uh, transition we have uh, profound changes to the energy system to the way we produce transport and consume uh, energy and the different challenges that we all know are of course more decentralization more decarbonization and also more digitalization and with the clean energy package we wanted to have a framework that uh, make the energy system more uh, modern, more integrated, but also more flexible so that it can integrate the uh, growing share of uh, uh, new generation capacity and also the, the new load. Um, so this has, of course, major implication on the role of GSO because a lot of these new challenges will, will take place also at the distribution level. And the GSO will play an important role in, in supporting the energy transition. So that's why we have two blocks. Uh, for an updating framework for the GSO. We have um, related provisions under chapter four of the electricity directive, and we also have some elements in the uh, electricity uh, regulation, um, which were adopted last year. So in this updated framework, we give new tasks to the uh, GSO. Uh, for instance, they will be able to use flexibility resources such as demand response, storage, um, and this will have to be done through a market-based procedure. That will help the GSO to optimize the operation of their grid and can, can contribute to uh, delaying or postponing investment in new infrastructure. Um, because of the central role that the GSO will play, it's important that they are a neutral uh, actor so that they can ensure that all the other uh, market actors have, has, have access to the market in a fair and a non-discriminatory way. And for that, um, we included in the clean energy package provisions that uh, the GSO should not uh, um, be involved in infrastructure that can provide flexibility services to the system. So it means that, for instance, they, they cannot own manage or develop uh, uh, the operation of uh, electric vehicle recharging points or storage facilities. Of course, there are uh, some exceptions that are uh, included in the, that the market has failed to deliver such, uh, such activities. And what's also important in, in all of that is to have a, 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 an adapted planning of uh, a distribution level. And that's where the network development plan will have a, an important role um, to make sure that the, the network is, is adapted to the challenges of the energy transition. Um, so this will help to have a, a more efficient planning and more efficient operation uh, which will also provide useful information to all the system users. And in the next slide, I will um, explain a little bit what we have in the network de development plan. Uh, if you can move to the next slide, please. So what exactly do we want you to, to have in those network development plans? So here the uh, legal basis uh, where you have all the information, the Article 32 of the Electricity Directive. So we want uh, in the network development plan that the GSO provide transparency on uh, what are the medium and long-term flexibility uh, needs. So they, the GSO will need to assess what will be the flexibility needs, what flexibility resources are available and what they can use. This will also send the signal to the network users and the flexibility provider that there is a need there as well. So it, it is also a way to incentivize uh, flexibility development. So GSOs will have to uh, take into account uh, demand response, energy efficiency, um, storage facilities or other sources of, uh, of the so uh, will, will be used, 
using, and that can constitute an alternative to, to grid dysfunction. Because here we want to go beyond the traditional approach of uh, solely grid expansion and really take into account the uh, potential that flexibility offers. Um, so the GSO will have to uh, set out the plan investment for the next five to 10 years. And they will have to focus on what is needed to connect these new generation capacity and the new loads. Um, in a way, this will be for them the opportunity to have a, a, a broad view on what is needed so that the decentralized generation can be fully taken into account and the new services as well can be taken into account. Of course, it's important to read this um, element on the network development plan also in relation with the other aspect of Article 32, um, because this Article 32 of the Electricity Directive is uh, important to incentivize the use of flexibility at GSO level. And flexibility and network development plan are very much integrated. And allow me to say that this is uh, very well captured in the SEER report that was uh, published in July on the uh, GSO procedure for flexibility procurement, uh, where it shows the relevance of network uh, development plan for incentivizing flexibility solution. So clearly here, the key message is that the planning and the use of flexibility goes, goes hand in hand. Um, next slide now. So on the process, so we've had already two uh, presentations explaining uh, very well the process, what it means in terms of uh, uh, transparency and consultation. So for the network development plan, uh, as it's uh, provided for in the clean energy package. So the plans will have to be submitted at least every two years. So this is a regular exercise uh, to make sure that the GSO uh, adapts rapidly to the evolving situation and that they do take into account on a very regular basis the um, evolution of the generation capacity that is there and of the new loads. So even if the plan are covering a period of investment for five um, or up to 10 years, the publication is every two years, which gives us the guarantee as well that the plans will be revised and more dynamic and that the flexibility that is developed can be taken into account and can be used. And for the process, the process is, uh, is uh, transparent. So we have a, a consultation, the GSO will have to consult the relevant system users and the GSOs. And then the results of the publication will be published uh, uh, along with the network development plan and will be submitted to the uh, regulatory authorities. So here, what's important is that with this Article 32, we give full power to the regulatory authorities. They will first have to assess the flexibility needs, the pro procurement of flexibility services, but also the type of projects, and they will have to analyze whether flexibility is sufficient, and they have to see this from an, uh, a cost-effective point of view. Um, and for that, they can, if it's not mandatory in the, in the directive, but it's, uh, they can also do a cost-benefit uh, cost uh, analysis. And then we also give full power to the regulatory authority to check the network development plans. They can uh, modify the plan if they want, and here, the role of the uh, NRA will be uh, very important um, in checking whether uh, flexibility has been sufficiently considered in the network development plan. So we want the regulator to, to look at uh, what are the flexibility needs in the plan, what kind is to be prov provided, what kind of projects are, are available, and this should be analyzed by the regulator. So here, the regulator is key. And uh, it has the, the, the full power to, to, to control and make sure that uh, flexibility is, uh, is taken into account in the plan. Um, what, in, what is also important and that I will discuss in the next slide is also the role of the cooperation between GSO and GSO um, in network operation develop, um, and development. Um, so GSO and TSO cooperation is becoming more and more important throughout the electricity directive and the regulation we, we've put in place some provisions to increase such cooperation um, because the evolution of the energy system, the use of and development of flexibility has implication on network operation both at distribution and transmission level. So it's important that the two uh, system operators have a coordinated an, uh, approach and that they cooperate. Um, 
so for the development plan, the, elect uh, the Article 32, Paragraph 4 explicitly refers and mentions that the DSO will have to consult the uh, transmission system operators in the development plan. And then you also have set requirements in the electricity regulation where it says that the DSO and the TSO have to co cooperate with each other in planning and operating their, their network. So they have to exchange all necessary information, um, take into account uh, demand response, and they have to exchange also information on their uh, daily operation uh, of network. Um, here, I would like also to point uh, to the very good discussion that uh, we have under the TSO and DSO cooperation platform. Uh, we had a meeting last July, we have an, a, a, another one next week, and this issue of uh, this topic of uh, network development plan is, uh, is discussed uh, under this cooperation platform. And at the last Copenhagen Forum, um, the Commission has asked both the DSO and the TSO to develop a roadmap for uh, coordinating, for the coordination of, of grid planning. And both the DSO and the TSO, they have started to look into that. They, uh, as a starting point, uh, developed, a, a, um, they, they looked at the scenario building and, and coordination principles, and they will present uh, uh, the results of their uh, discussion also at the next Copenhagen Forum, which will take place um, at the end of this month. And so for the next slide, um, what is also important to support such TSO and TSO cooperation is the establishment of the EU TSO entity. Um, so the regulation, the electricity regulation specifies uh, the, the role, the structure, the objective of the EU TSO entity. And this entity will formalize as well uh, the, the, the position of the GSO at the at the European level, allow them to participate as well in uh, the development of network code, for instance, um, and in the drafting of other of key uh, secondary legislation, for instance, on cybersecurity, on the demand side flexibility, or on access to data. Um, so the Commission received the draft statutes uh, earlier, um, a couple of months ago. Uh, Acer delivered its opinion, and now the Commission is in the final stages of uh, uh, publishing its opinion on the EU GSO entity. Um, it should be uh, the Commission uh, opinion should be published uh, by the end of November, and we foresee uh, the EU GSO to be uh, formally established and launched. Uh, early next year. So this uh, new EU GSO entity, as I said, will contribute to the elaboration of network code, uh, contribute to the development of demand response. It will also look into the digitalization of uh, distribution network. And in particular, for the relevance of uh, network development plan, it will um, promote TSO co and DSO cooperation. So it will uh, support uh, to adapt, it will help to build, well, one of the tasks, sorry, is to have a, um, the adoption of best practices on the coordinated uh, operation and planning of distribution and, and transmission systems. And already the NSOE and uh, the, the four GSOs association have already initiated some, some discussion on, the, on this ahead of the EU GSO uh, um, launch. And they have already developed a draft MOU, which covers general principles for cooperation, uh, notably on applying best practices and on operation and, and planning. And uh, they will report on the draft MOU at the next uh, GSO, co GSO cooperation platform, which I said will take place uh, next week. So I will wrap it up here, but uh, so next, uh, no, yeah. It's finally the, the final slide, yes, but uh, so I gave a very short overview. Most of the topics were already covered already in the, in the previous presentation, but what I really want to insist on is that flexibility and network development plan really are very much integrated. They very much go in hand, hand in hand. And what I also want to insist on is on the role of the regulatory authorities that they are going to play in assessing the plans and in making sure that uh, flexibility is well uh, taken into account. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marion. It was an excellent presentation. I know.
where it could point to the regulators as well. Thank you for those. Unfortunately, we, we had some questions for you, but the time is running out, so we will try to address them at the end. So now we have to move uh, to the panel discussion. Um, and then our moderator in this panel discussion is Arthur Nuinser. He works for the Florida School of Regulation. Uh, he's a research associate. Uh, and specialized on energy electricity regulation research, and he's working in that team. Please, out there, the floor is yours. Thank you, Veli Pekka. So, after seeing today the current practice of distribution network development plan, and then moving, seeing with uh, Marion some the development according to the clean energy package. Now we will go to the first or to the panel discussion of today, where we will discuss challenges and advantages of the distribution network development plans. And we have uh, five panelists that represent different stakeholders in relation with the um, development of uh, with the development plans of DS. And first, we have uh, Kenneth Haninen, who is who is a chairman of uh, GOD Working Group Regulation, and he's also director at the Finnish Energy, uh, which is also an organization representing um, DSO for electricity and gas in um, Finland. We also have Mark McGranagan, who is vice president innovation at the Electric Power Research Institute, EPRI. We then we have Patrick Clarence, who is Secretary General of the European Association for Storage of Energy, call it EASE. And uh, we have a representative of uh, the Energy Department of the Finnish Ministry of Economic Affairs and Employment, which is uh, Elina Hauta Kangas. And finally, we have uh, Lucas, Luca Loschiavo, who is Deputy Director of the Infrastructure Regulation Department at the Italian Regulatory Authority for Energy, call it ARERA. So, what we will do in this panel discussion, or how we'll organize it, since we have kind of tight timing, every panelist will have seven minutes to for an, an opening statement, and then we'll do a round of questions. And then after that, we have 15 minutes for a Q&A session, that for, especially for a question that we receive from the audience. So we will start now with um, Kenneth Haninen, uh, the representative of Chiode. So please, uh, Kenneth, can you share with us some views of distribution network development plans from the European level perspective of DSO? And also, can you please tell us to which level, for instance, we, could, we should go to which, which level of detail we should go in these plans? Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have only one slide, so I think I don't need that uh, seven minutes. Uh, I can give it to to someone else. Uh, I would like okay. to emphasize uh, in my presentation the the or in my slide this uh, TSO's growing role in the future energy system. Uh, we all know that uh, climate change is our biggest challenge at the moment, uh, and uh, I can promise you that uh, DSOs will help to save the planet if uh, they get the chance. Uh, fight against uh, climate change uh, means that uh, electricity will supply supplant uh, fossil fuels, we all know that, and we have seen it, uh, it will happen in uh, heating, in uh, industry, in traffic. It means that the consumption of electricity will increase. We will have more energy production, mostly renewables, uh, decentralized uh, wind and sun. Greater part of renewables will be connected to DSO grid. It means that we, we need more new investments, so we have better security supply and increased capacity. DSOs will play, play a significant role in future energy system. The role of DSOs will grow also at customer level. DSO will create a neutral market marketplace and act as a neutral market actor. The clean energy package will bring new tasks for DSOs and uh, as I see it, it is a bit unclear is there a plan uh, is, is there a balance between new tasks responsibilities and power if you think about dsos and most important thing is that what we build today 
will be used in 2050s. That means a huge challenge to development plans. It's also a challenge to DSOs, but also a challenge to the regulators. So I look forward to a lively, a lively discussion in this panel. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Kenneth, for this uh, introductory speech. So I think now we sh with Mark, can we, we would go more into details uh, from Mark, who is representing uh, EPRI. And so Mark, can you let us, um, f according to your pers perspective, what is how critical can be the distribution network development plans? And also, what are the main challenges that are facing us for that? And yeah, finally, as you come from academia, which research gap you could see in those plans? Perfect. So first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in the panel. I thought the perspectives from Portugal, from the regulator perspective and Finland from the DSO perspective and the overall EU perspective were very valuable. And uh, Kenneth reinforced that the role of the DSO is only going to increase in importance as we have more resources connected to the distribution system as we electrify other aspects of the energy system the uh, the dso is going to become absolutely critical in connecting these resources to markets and to uh, opportunities to be part of the overall resiliency and reliability equation i thought that uh, i'm coming to you from dublin ireland so i'm familiar with the activities going on in Europe, and we have a close relationship with EDSO and NSOE working on uh, many aspects of these development plans. But I thought today I would give a perspective from activities going on in the US just to illustrate that these issues and needs are the same all over the world. Um, in California, um, all of the uh, investor-owned utilities have developed what they call distribution resource plans that they were initially submitted back in 2015. They've all been updated um, in 2020. And uh, those plans provide um, their network development plans and opportunities for stakeholders to engage. New York is another example, the Con Edison um, picture of their plan is implemented here. In New York, they call them distribution system implementation plans, and they provide a roadmap for how distributed resources will integrate with the distribution system and become part of the overall market and the mechanics of how that will work. We work together with the Department of Energy in the U.S. to develop a kind of a guideline for developing grid modernization plans. We call it the it's called the DSPX project. If you Google DSPX, you'll find all of these documents. There's about four volumes to this to this effort, and it's, uh, a good description of what needs to be included in a distribution network plan. These plans serve a number of purposes. They they support stakeholder coordination in the both the New York and, and the California plans and in many other states in the US, these plans have to include hosting capacity maps so that third parties that want to connect energy storage or photovoltaics to the grid, they know where constraints will be in the, in the grid's ability to integrate those technologies. Same thing with electrification, hosting capacity concepts can be applied the same way. So the stakeholder coordination for participation in markets, non-wires alternatives for coordination around data is an important part of these plans. Number two is, is, the, is the actual integration of the distributed resources, as well as integration with customers and communities. Community integration is a very big part of these plans. Um, right now, the Department of Energy has a big um, opportunity that they're accepting proposals for to do big regional demonstrations of integrating smart buildings and smart communities. And we have to figure out how those community integration efforts become part of their distribution plans. 
Of course, electrification is a big challenge. We have to be able to forecast and integrate where electrification is occurring and what the impacts are on the local distribution system and how we can deal with those impacts in the most uh, efficient and optimum way. And finally, and probably the most important is resilience and re resiliency and reliability planning. Hearing the finished example of undergrounding distribution systems was uh, very encouraging. Resiliency of the distribution system is going to become more and more important as we continue to electrify more critical functions of communities. So we have to make sure we address that. And of course, we're dealing with many of these issues in the US right now with wildfires and storms um, at unprecedented uh, levels. So maybe I can go on to the next slide and talk about the challenges that we see in developing these network plans. And as an R&D organization, um, it's, it's good to identify what, what we see as kind of the, the research topics where we need to work together as an entire industry. And these are five, five examples of priorities that we see. One is the kind of common approaches and visions for criteria for doing the planning. With the, we, have, we have new objectives, we have stakeholder engagement, the visions of what the future infrastructure is gonna look like and, and how the integration will occur that becomes part of our common planning criteria and practices. We need to be able to forecast the electrification, the adoption of distributed resources, whether it's PV or energy storage, the ability for demand response to contribute to the investment in the distribution grid. So forecasting is a particular research need that it, and in this case it involves, you know, actually understanding customer preferences and customer attitudes will become a big part of that forecasting. Number three is the actual tools and methods for doing these system assessments and, and plugging into plans. So a big aspect of that is TSO DSO coordination and what I call integration of planning and operations. So our tools for planning have to include the technologies and control system characteristics that we will we will need to understand to operate the system. So kind of our operations technologies and systems has to become part of our planning tools. Um, number four is non-wires alternatives and how we're gonna deal with including customer and community and distributed resource um, opportunities as part of our assessment of investment requirements. And, and finally is that overall approach to evaluating the economics and prioritizing uh, different alternatives for, um, for expansion and investment in, of the grid, taking into account things like the uncertainty of some of these resources, the lifetime of the resources, the lead times and investment requirements, and so on. And these new um, methods are going to need to include probabilistic approaches that are not typically used in planning right now. So those are five of the of the categories of challenges that I see are absolutely critical, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Mark. That was absolutely interesting seeing the experience of the U.S. and also the challenges that you see and that uh, that are, could be faced by DSO in those um, planning processes. So now let us go to the um, third panelist, Patrick uh, Clarence, who is Secretary General of Ease. So Patrick, can you please turn on? Yeah, you are there. So as a um, Secretary General of Ease, can you please um, give us your um, views on the role you estimate that the energy storage solution could have and also what are the different solutions that could be used in the um, could be considered in the um, uh, these plans and yeah finally which kind of business case could be uh, needed or are needed to for the storage unit to be uh, to get uh, a chance in the market thanks Thank you, Artie. So I have a full 45 minutes presentation to make now if I got the topics you asked me to address, um, which <laughs> which I will not be able to do in seven minutes. So I will not address all these points, at least not in the presentation now. 
but in the discussion i would be very happy to um, come back to all these points you just mentioned and go into the details here yeah, i want first to introduce very shortly in my uh, seven minutes the ease so ease is a european association for storage of energy we are representing different stakeholders different constituencies on storage we have component suppliers material suppliers utilities um, equipment suppliers consultancies distribution system operators and also transmission system operators and our members so we are very broad which can be challenging can be challenging to find a current position and the one i will explain now is the role or the ownership of energy storage related to regulated entities it was very challenging to find but we managed to find a common position i'm very happy about this and just a moment i will come back to this in a moment can you go one slide back but for the moment we we uh, grow by the number of companies and we grow by the number of sectors so it's really showing um that we are um the trend the energy storage topic is getting more and more important we see it in all the documents so on the next slide, obviously energy storage is just one means of flexibility. There are a lot of uh, different ways of getting energy and flexibility to a system. Um, we see uh, obviously the mindset management, which has a huge potential and a lot can be kept, mainly in industry, but it's not really clear how the consumer will react and if uh, the electric vehicles will deliver the flexibility which we are hoping it will deliver, because if a person needs to drive to the hospital, I'm not sure, I want to, to take any risk that the battery will not be two, three, five hundred percent more charged than it needs to be. Um, grid extension, we heard it today. It's a very good tool. It's a wired alternative, which we do. Um, but we see that the social acceptance is becoming increasingly limited. So we get more and more cost to get these lights on the ground, these um, uh, lines on the ground. And we therefore have an increase in the investment, which is needed. And uh, the time to do this is also increasing. We have the um, flexible conventional generation but we see that in europe a lot of conventional generation thermal generation and, and fossil fuel based generation is uh, going down we do not see that this is conventional generation can be replaced with only biomass we don't have enough biomass for this so we're coming back to renewable energy sources which obviously um, provide a lot of generation more and more generation and will will be the backbone of, of the electricity generation in the future and therefore we need energy storage to go with this because energy storage is very flexible by nature it's very fast reacting and can deliver a lot of services like that synthetic inertia which are done by other parts for the moment so that's why we see that energy storage is one of the major components where we want to to move forward and it's not enough for the moment and um, take into consideration in the network planning it's not enough seen as a tool and this tool can have different functions obviously it can be used as a market instrument playing on the market but it can also be seen as a grid asset and there is a discussion about fully integrated grid components and energy storage can be one of those in to some extent at least this is what's, what's mentioned in the clean energy package um, when you look at this energy storage and the question of ownership of energy storage the main point we addressed this was not to ask who may own energy storage this was for us not the main question because it's not really relevant the question is who may provide which services to the system through energy storage and here this is the big difference because if you're a regulated entity you should never be allowed to apply uh, to supply flexibility like frequency containment reserve frequency restoration reserve or uh, other products which are typically tendered on the market this is not to be provided by a regulated entity obviously it's a market product so this has to be provided by market participants but the clean energy package is also very clear if there is no market and if the services are not provided by the market then a regulated entity is allowed to own energy storage as a backup position, uh, for example, if we need to have uh, this uh, installation done. I give one example, which is uh, often uh, stated. If you want to have energy um, electric vehicles and therefore you need distributed uh, charging and fast charging points, uh, very often you would need to support the distribution system with energy storage devices so that at the peak demand, at the charging demand, we do not have the um the over so, or, or we do not get the, the dso system to the limits or over the limits which it can provide because the dso 
the, the networks in the DSO were not normally designed to include a lot of uh, electric vehicle charging. Maybe in Finland it's different with the saunas. Um, which means that you will have to put energy storage devices down, big batteries or other storage devices, so that you can provide the peak demand for the charging infrastructure. And this could be very little economically interesting for market player in the beginning, as long as there are no electric vehicles available or very few electric vehicles available. So we could imagine that it's the role of a DSO to kickstart this and to put down the energy storage devices together with the charging station and to therefore own and operate them until at least the market kicks off. And then it should not be, and uh, it's also described in the clean energy package how such a uh, exit would then look like um, in order to get it on the market. But we could imagine a situation where energy storage needs to be kickstart by regulated entity. And that's why on the next slide, we have started to uh, think of this and we made this position paper, which is on our web page, which is called multi-service business cases. And we say basically that you need to always maximize utilization of these devices to maximize social welfare. So it makes no sense if there is, for example, no market participants who would like to start this charging infrastructure that uh, a TSO jumps in and then uses it only for the services of charging. And why should this device then not be used by, by other by market players for market services? So in reality, it would look like a DSO owns it, uses the capacity it needs at the time it needs, and will make the market players, uh, will make this capacity, this device, accessible to the market players at the times when the regulated entity does not need it. And this will be obviously counted against the cost because it's a revenue, which will then reduce the overall burden, the overall cost to the consumer, which otherwise would pay this through the network charges. So it's uh, uh, some recommendations on either a regulated entity or a non-regulated entity who would own these devices and how they play together. I'm very curious to see if this will um, really uh, roll out or not. Thank you very much. Next slide is just the contact details. Okay. Thank you, Patrick. I think you raised a very particular point for our next panelist, Elina, she's an advocate for market-based approaches for an energy market, and she's a representative of the Finnish Ministry of Trade and Employment in Finland. And uh, so, Elina, having already seen that uh, the case study or the uh, of um, uh, or the presentation of the uh, uh, Elenia, the Finnish TSO, can you in seven minutes? Tell us about the legislative requirement in Finland uh, for the SO and for their distribution plans and whether also maybe a comment on the role of DSO in owning storage and what you are planning to uh, uh, enforce in Finland. So please. Thank you very much. Good afternoon or good, good day. It's afternoon here in Finland already. Um, indeed, maybe before I go into my my presentation. Uh, the question about the storage is just as, as Jorma Müllimäki was sub thinking that um, when it's integrated network component, the use of uh, storage is okay on the system system operation side. But so, um, my name is indeed Elina Hautakangas and I've been working uh, in the ministry for two years now, but I have a quite a strong background from the DSO side and also from the regulator. So I've been uh, involved in these issues for quite a long time. And uh, thank you for all these good presentations before. I think uh, especially the Commission's presentation gave a good overview on the on the new DSO tasks and the changing role of the DSO in general in coming years. I think uh, in order to have not only uh, the, the network development plan in place, but also to introduce the flexibility into the system, we basically need three things. So we need the DSO network development plans. We also need flexibility from the market. And then uh, I think we also need a proper system level coordination between the DSOs and DSOs. And as I think Kenneth uh, already underlined in his presentations, of course, the energy transition will challenge us in very new ways. Uh, we had the 2020 climate targets that introduced intermittent power production and started uh, the chains also on the, the system side. 
And now we have the challenge of electrification and sector integration that will require yet another change in thinking. And uh, now I think it's very good that we've started to, to discuss the DSO level flexibility and the challenges ahead. And it's, it will be quite a systemic change as you've, you've seen so far. So in Finland, we have a strong uh, distribution network. We don't have any significant bottlenecks, but the challenge is that we have 77 DSOs and we're 5.5 million people, so that's quite a lot. So we have to design a fair and not over complex model. And we, of course, we've already have uh, the legislative proposal in place. Uh, will be presented next week, actually. And as Jorma Mullimaki from Elenia already presented, uh, the, the DS, uh, DSOs have actually already had a network development plan requirement in the legislation for a few years now. Uh, and what we will now do, we will include the new requirements uh, from the, the directive. So that is the, the use of demand response, energy efficiency, uh, energy storage facilities, and and also the uh, other resources that could be used uh, as an alternative for grid investments. So that is what we are basically doing. And I, as I interpret the directive, the the objective, of course, is to foster ex flexibility. But from the DSO side, it's to ensure a full palette of DSO measures to both uh, to renew, expand and increase the level of security of supply in the DSO network. And also it has to be done on a cost efficient basis. And that is something that is very important to us in Finland. And if, of course, then uh, as presented already, the NRA then have, has the competence to evaluate these network development plans and even request changes if they consider that, for example, the cost efficient efficiency uh, evaluation is not done correctly uh, so when you, you you look at the alternative measures and the grid investments there has to be a balance of course and also in in our regulation well, we will require actually specific measures that will improve uh, the reliability the system reliability and there needs to needs also to be a flexibility service uh, the need for flexibility services, the DSO will need, it has to be assessed on short term and then on, on mid term. Mid term, I think, uh, was it up to 10 years? And then, of course, the cost efficiency has to be uh, done uh, in a compar comparative way. So you have to compare the cost of different, uh, different measures. And we also have, of course, the, the national security assets to be taken into account in the uh, in the the plan and as uh, already presented the directive requires uh, an update at least every two years and of course there will be the consultations and publications of the plan and then uh, when we did uh, because until now we haven't published the, the network development plans and this is now required, of course, then we have the security of supply issue that we also have to address that what level of information and the granularity, as Jorma said, should be also well evaluated because we have some, especially on the TSO side, but I think it might be a problem also on the DSO level, that uh, what information we shall give on the, the critical branches. So we don't want to risk operational security, of course. But of course, the Finnish tradition with a more holistic approach, I think, will help with that. And we don't have a very, um, very detailed uh, requirements. It's left for the, uh, the NRA then to, to decide. Um, then, as I said, uh, on the flexibility, I have no idea how long I've been uh, speaking. No, that's, with, yeah. Perfectly on time. We can now switch. I mean, that's uh, you reach it perfectly. The seven minute now, so we could leave the last part to the um, perfect. Discussion. Thank you. Yeah, you you ended your speech by mentioning that the NRA would have a, a role to or this some decision to take for the distribution development plan. And now we have Luca, who is a representative of the of our era, the Italian regulator. 
Uh, Luca, please, can you turn on your camera? Yeah. Hi. Um, and uh, Elina, you talked about the information that has to be included in the plan and some security of supply aspect that has to be considered. You also mentioned the horizon. And I want to ask Lucas to uh, give us the um, uh, way you are doing this in Italy and what do you think should be included in this plan? And especially as uh, there is a different um, um, uh, plans that will be submitted, how to ensure the consistency and, for example, for the input data of the plans, how to be to, to have them uh, like a standardized framework or standardized data model that should be used? Luca, you have to turn on your mic. It's uh, just on top of the camera. Uh, no, Luca, it's not. We cannot hear you yet. Can you hear uh, me now? When it's yeah, high. now perfect. Okay. perfect. Thank you very much. Yes, we started in uh, in Italy with distribution network plans uh, uh, several years ago, uh, ten years ago exactly, with uh, the decision of the regulator imposing uh, on uh, these major DSOs, uh, greater than uh, 100,000 customers, uh, to have their own network development plans. At that time, Italy was impacted by an enormous increase of distributed generation. And among our uh, regulatory requirements, uh, there was also the obligation to show in the internet uh, what Mark called the hosting capacity maps. Uh, if uh, uh, Lislot can go down in, in this page on the internet, you can see the Italian map. Thank you, Lislot. Yes. If you click in the, in the, on the Italy uh, one, several times, you can go there. Yes, please click, click there. Oh, again, again, again go down and you will see again thank you that's okay you see that there are three colors white yellow and and uh, orange for the time being if you move uh, the map downwards to southern regions you observe that we don't have no red zones but we Almost Italy is covered in orange. Orange means that the input of distributed generation is higher than the, the load. So typically, the southern regions in Italy behave as a generator in many, many hours of the, of the day. And this is a big impact, enormous impact for Italy. Uh, in, in the past, 10 years ago, we also had red areas where there was a critical condition, so uh, we were very close to curtail uh, generation, uh, distributed generation, but nowadays all red zones have been cleared. We are in this condition that, uh, and I only want to show this tool because we think it's very important for transparency and it's very related distribution plans. Thank you. This lot that we can close that. Uh, so I say that the, uh, the, the Italian DSOs had this obligation since uh, 2010. In 2011, a law uh, strengthened the, the, the force of regulatory requirement. Nowadays, there is a law requiring that all major DSO publish their own distribution network plans. There is not yet, not yet a regulatory treatment, and the, there is not yet an obligation for consultation. Although we know that uh, plans are prepared consulting the TSO data. We are, Italy is now going to the transpos national transposition of Directive 944, and therefore a, a, a new uh, regulatory framework will be introduced soon. A very important uh, reasoning is about the content of distribution network plans. 
because uh, we listened today that there are several uh, interpretations, let's say. For instance, uh, in Italy, everything started from the renewable impact. So this was the first priority 10 years ago. Nowadays, we have further priorities on the same plans. For instance, resilience. We, as a regulator, introduced the obligation that a section of the netto development plan has to be dedicated to resilience, to projects that can improve locally according to a risk assessment, the distribution network plan where, where it is too weak. Uh, of course, uh, as, uh, as also was said by the colleague from the Finnish ministry, new electrification and sector integration are also very important targets. So, my let's say my question, my wonder is how how we can have all these uh, variety of priorities in network distribution plan. This can be really difficult and is a challenge for the next future. Uh, I suppose that's my view that uh, countries among Europe are very different each other, but also within each country, within each member state, there are important differences. For instance, in Italy, we have the Alps region that has totally different issues for distribution than southern regions or sea coast regions, or Sardinia, for instance. So uh, distribution network plans uh, must follow the local priority. That's very important and also very difficult. Of course, we as a regulator are mandated to, let's say, address all the topics in the, in the context. Another important issue, in my view, is horizon of plans. The, the, the directive says five to 10 years. I think that uh, although distribution shall have a, a long-term vision, in practice, in practice, I think that uh, at least five years is the most reasonable horizon, at least for the time being. And it is compliant with the five to ten years requirement in the, in the directive. A further very important point is the consistency of inputs among plans. Of course, there is a national um, excuse me, a network development plans for the transmission grid according to the legislation. And behind that plan, there are scenarios. Can scenarios at distribution level be not consistent with the scenario used at national level and at European level? How to ensure such a consistency if we have to look and to, and to allow that local priorities are are considered. This is a very, very difficult topic. We, for instance, at national level, are pushing towards a major and more important integration between gas and electricity for the national transmission and transport plans. And we want to have DSO, DSO consistency, but nonetheless, uh, specific territories can have different requirements, different needs, and even different forecast in the demand in the next years. For instance, electrification of cars will probably impact more cities than rural areas. So uh, there is the, the difficulty of the regulator is to keep together the local dimension with the, the national dimension and behind. The European dimension. Just one word. I, I maybe no. Okay. That's oh, go please. Okay. Uh, the, the, the last very the last very important challenge is how to introduce the network development plan in the tariff regulation. We think to move the tariff regulation towards a more forward-looking approach. Instead of looking at the already done investments, considering also the plan as a trajectory 
that is an agreement between the DSO and the regulator. And so this will be a strong push for DSOs to have credible plans. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luca. I invite all the panelists to open their camera for a Q&A session. And um, Luca, you raised one important point about the consistency between distribution plans. I guess one of the uh, tools that are that aims to solve at least or to try to solve this uh, um, topic or this issue is the public consultation. And George, you already had like a public, a public consultation in Portugal for the distribution uh, uh, plan uh, with one DSO, as I understood, but it had to get uh, um, uh, feedbacks from the TSO and uh, other stakeholders. So can you give us some um, examples or of the feedback that ha were given there and uh, how it helped to ensure the consistency of these plans for the Portuguese case? Okay, thank you very, very much for the question, Atir. Um, probably uh, looking for the questions that appeared in, in, the, in the chat, I, I would emphasize two, two ideas first. It's important to clarify that our national development plan and the public consultation is prepared by the SO that is the only responsible for it. Okay. The, however, the DSO has the, the attention, the practice of discuss previously, previously and in advance with the regulator and with the ministry body that uh, the main op options that he put in the projects. So uh, w w before the presentation, probably there are some discussion and but the only responsible for the plans are the DSOs. The key for a correct draft network development is the cooperation with the SO and the other uh, low voltage ne network, that is your question. And also the development of traditional and all the new user, network users that we are expecting. Also, it's important to emphasize that the network development plan is approved by the ministry in charge of foreign energy after all the present approval process. And also from the perspective of a regulator, and the answer some of the questions, after the, the efficient implementation of that uh, plan and the and that investment projects, the investment costs are approved that are approved in the national development plan are the basis for the yearly acceptance of the costs from the regulator side to be considered in the DSO yearly revenue. This closed the loop in the in the process. The approved um, uh, investment costs that are approved in the network net development plan after their efficient implementation are the basis of, of the revenues and this closed loop in my and I believe that is important. Answering to your question is very important that cooperation and for instance we have a previously cooperation between the, the DSO and the, for instance low voltage uh, network development uh, net, uh, low voltage only um, um, network operators or with TSO. And sometimes it's clear that a, pro, a, a, a certain project must be intercorrelated. We must analyze with the TSO the costs from one side in the their plan with the costs and the consequences to the, the in the DSO and vice versa. This is a very important aspect because the two investment plans must be coherent in that level. Another aspect, for instance, in our case, probably is not the example for all the other countries. The low voltage only uh, network operators in Portugal are little ones. So all of them have an exception in our law, and I believe that is coherent with the, the actual uh, European law, to have a plan. They make their investments, we consider their costs, but there are, um, is not a specific plan. However, the coordination between the location of the MV substations and MV uh, low voltage uh, substations are very important. So this cooperation is very important. And one example in answering to your question out here, we have this, we hope to have that previous experience of cooperation between the low voltage operator with the, 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 the SEO that is preparing the network open plan. It was not well done. And what we see in this plan that we have today in, the, in this public consultation, a comment coming from the low voltage uh, operator 
public is saying that their discussion it was not successful and now is in the public discussion the correct location of one of the substations that connect the two networks so the importance of public consultations allow to clarify to make transparency the decision that is taken by the so for that situation if it's justified or not justified the interest of this low voltage operator i don't know if i am able, or able to uh, uh, answer to your question thank you thank you george and yeah let's hear the uh, Geo, the view on the public consultation process, Kenneth, you already mentioned it or referred to it briefly, but uh, can you give us the, your views on how it should organize this public consultation? I'm sorry, but I, I don't know. <laughs> I think the, the problem is that uh, when it's uh, written in the directive that uh, all uh, customers uh, Today and in future should be consult should be involved in this consultation. It's quite open and demanding challenge to the DSO how to let's say find the coming customers in the future. And even those customers who are already in in the grid, they are most of the customers are household customers. I, I think it's it's very difficult task for DSO to make this consultation. Of course, we have discussed uh, if it's possible to, let's say, have some open consultation in web pages and then uh, some other customers can answer, but uh, you hardly can cover all customers. So far, the process is uh, it's open in Finland. We have not uh, discussed with our regulator. Thank you, thank you, Kenneth. I guess uh, there is also another um, hard topic, which is, as I saw, there are some question on that. Is um, where how the distribution plan should uh, value flexibility or should consider non-wire alternative, in, and um, how 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 to value them, taking into account the uncertainty about the future. For the energy sector in general and also the irreversibility of the investment that both together could create an option value uh, for the flexibility so anyone who has in thoughts how we could uh, take into account the value of flexibility in the trade-off which is one of the most critical or interesting point in this uh, distribution plans uh, may I start because I would like to challenge Patrick here because uh, now we have a good question in, in the chat uh, where it uh, said that uh, how to account non viral alternatives as you said and non viral alternatives as I see they are flexibility and uh, uh, batteries and uh, now the problem is that uh, these are two kind of costs non-wire alternatives they are opex and uh, investments are capex and now in uh, many countries uh, these costs are treated differently and that's a problem uh, if uh, uh, dso has two alternatives either buy non-wire alternatives by flexibility or by uh, battery capacity then it's opex and if the dso decide to invest it's capex and uh, many countries, OPEX is uh, it's a uh, it's a bad thing for for DSO and uh, investment is a more economical solution. So I think uh, to make it possible for DSO to use flexibility, we have to have uh, big changes in regulatory models. So we instead of capex and OPEX, we will uh, handle totex. Maybe I can reply to this, uh, Atya. Kenneth, you're absolutely yes, right. I, I, uh, you put the finger exactly where matters, which is money. It's always about the money at the end. Yeah. Um, so when you're looking at uh, the devices like storage and other flexibility providers, there are in general two points which you need to consider. The first is to recognize the added value of these devices compared to a wired alternative. And I will give an example. We see that more and more renewable energy sources are installed which is good and they are installed in regions which didn't have a lot of generation before so you see that the lines which were put down like 
10 years ago, very often were done with a different point of view of the development of the renewable sources, which therefore not necessarily match anymore the, 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 the need for the grid. Therefore, if you put energy storage devices down, like batteries, for example, which are normally containerized solutions, they can move around. They can move around and go to congestion places and solve these congestions in the evolution of the grid. You don't build something for 30 or 50 years. These devices can be moved around and placed where it's needed. That's the first thing. So recognize the value, but all the values these devices have, and don't limit it to a very small, narrow fraction of them. The second point is the revenue, which you mentioned. Um, it is true that normally, depending on, on the countries, uh, TSO or DSO has a certain percentage, typically around 6%, sometimes it can be more, on the revenue, uh, on the costs uh, it has for the capital expenditure. So if I invest 100 million, I will have roughly 6 million as a revenue a year on this 100 million. Um, if I tender a service out on the market and it costs me for one year, I don't know, 10 million, I will be able to claim a very little surcharge of this, but it will never be 600,000 euros. So uh, this 6% will never be the one which will be gained by the uh, regulated entity. And as long as this is not addressed and solved, that the, um, there is no perverse incentive to install capacity just because you have a CAPEX which is higher remunerated, then on OPEX, as long as you don't solve this, you will always have this, um, this incentive, which is uh, counter uh, technology neutral. It's not technology neutral. We want to, to have this. So a TOTEX approach, like Kenneth said, or there are some other thinkings also going on, would be a, a good first step. But it's important to talk about this. Thank you, Patrick. I guess in Italy, there is a TOTEX approach, Luca, right? Or... Yes, yes, we uh, we are moving towards the topics approach, and uh, I, I want to explain a couple of things. First, public consultation. In the Totex approach, the plan is extremely important, so the DSO has to be committed on its plan. We already um, implemented a first case of consultation on DSO plans, but for metering, not for distribution yet. For metering, the distribution company in Italy must consult its own plan before it is approved, before it is approved. And when we approve it, we consider also the issues raised by the stakeholder, the network users, uh, supplier, and so on. For the metering and we want this issue to be solved to be solved by the dso before approval the second point is about equalization of capex and opex we as italian regulator are fully engaged on this so we don't want that there is a let's say make uh, make uh, privilege we don't want that absolutely but on the other side we want to see the real advantage of, of the solution. And I must say that we, our, our regulation so far has been the following for storage. If a DSO, uh, before the directive, of course, if a DSO want to install a storage or even to buy service from a storage installed by a private owner, he must prove this is a best a better solution than other ones and we provided a cost benefit analysis developed by the university of cagliari and tested on real networks and it, it's according to the parameters so the cost of the line the cost of the storage the penetration of renewable many other issues and the different of course, benefit that the storage plan can, the storage unit can provide that uh, uh, the cost benefit rate, benefit to cost ratio was higher than one only in very, very limited occasions. 
given the cost of the technology for, for nowadays. Of course, this can change in the future. So our approach is already to look at the final net benefit, benefit minus cost, independently if this is a CAPEX or an OPEX. But uh, for the time being, we didn't have any uh, submission of such a case. Uh, and I realize, I also realize that for a private investor, there is a problem due to the uncertainty in the future. And therefore, we, as in Italy, are uh, pushing towards a sort of capacity mechanism for storage that can help this technology to, to, to be, to be down, to be used. widespread. As for instance, a big case for, for Italy is Sardinia. Sardinia really needs storage if renewable in Sardinia will take a big, a big increase in the next years. Already they have developed a lot, but the plants of the government are really huge. Therefore, uh, probably storage will be absolutely needed. Uh, this is a big topic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Luca. I would I would like to see the yeah exactly, Mark. I was I was going to divert the question to you for according to the experience with this integrated resource plan in the U.S. and till now, how how are you seeing these uh, uh, challenges in the planning in the data and for uh, distribution energy resource forecasting, and whether yeah. you also have the problem of or the issue of public consultation there. Um, we, we absolutely have exactly the same problems, and I think that that energy storage um, is kind of the the poster child for dealing with these problems because of the multiple value stream characteristic of energy storage that can provide flexibility in the wholesale market. It can be a non wires alternative and at the distribution level and it can be a resiliency solution for an individual customer or a community. And those uh, multiple value streams can be um, conflicting in terms of the, the potential um, application of that, of that resource um, you know, for, for the different streams and, and how it gets monetized so that if a distribution company plans on that storage as a non-wires alternative, but it's more valuable to be a flexibility resource in the wholesale market, you know, that becomes a, a conflict in the future. So it il illustrates the importance of the TSO, DSO coordination, the market coordination. So if, if we're going to use local markets as a way to do non-wires alternatives, we have to be able to plan for that. If, you know, two really good examples. One is a, a coming up with a standard design for fast electric vehicle charging installations that include energy storage to help manage the demand. That energy storage can also be a flexibility resource in the wholesale market. It can be a resiliency resource. We need to come up with a common way of planning for that asset. Whoever owns it, whoever owns it, it's gonna be the, the uh, monetization of those, that resource has to be similar approach. And the other, the other component is res resiliency. We're seeing widespread application of energy storage in California for PV and storage as a resiliency solution for individual customers. But we we just had a new a new uh, order from FERC in the U.S. called FERC Order 2222 that requires that the wholesale market consider those resources as legitimate resources in in the wholesale markets as well. And we don't have the mechanisms to do that. So, but what's the impact of those resources participating in wholesale markets on our distribution plans for those resources. So very important, same problems. Yeah, that's thank you, Mark. That's exactly the same problems. Probably we should find together or converge to the same uh, to the common solution. So let me pick out uh, some question from the Q and A um, or from the chat. And there is one question to uh, Elina and to Jorge, which is about considering uh, distribution uh, 
uh, planning uh, requirement for small DSO that are serving less than 100,000 customers, and they are asking you what are what are you planning, whether you are planning to enforce that or not in Finland or in uh, Portugal. Elina, please, if you have any yes, input. Uh, no, we yeah, can you hear hear me now? Yes, we will in, enforce. Uh, we 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 will not enforce the derogation. So everyone will do the network implementation and uh, network development plan. I, uh, if I may, just on two or few words in two sentences uh, on the discussion that was interesting just before. Um, I think uh, now we were discussing about um, how do we take this uh, service level. Uh, cost in the regulated asset base uh, and the, the tariff models and that is something that we've been also thinking quite a lot and uh, of course the directive only speak about, speaks about the re remuneration for the DSOs for the flexibility services and uh, but we also have to incentivize flexibility we have the network development plan but i don't think it's enough so in any case uh, the the main tool is for the nra to try and and, and change the regulatory um, methodology for the tariff setting so that it doesn't so much uh, overvalue um, capex costs over opex and i think of course because the finnish system is a bit such that it's based on the on the capex and the regulated asset base so i think that's that's a real challenge for the the nra but if we want to get of course we have the obligation of certain services to uh, procure flexibility for the dso so that will help to an extent it's not enough to incentivize the use of flexibility. So I think that's also a, a key point that there's some legislative measures we can also take uh, in that regard. Thank you. Thank you, Elina. Um, I might mention that, that the topic of developing network development plans for small DSOs is also you know common in many areas. We have about 3,000 municipals and co-ops in the United States and they still need to do development plans. And I, what happens is that associations of these smaller DSOs can help develop the template for the development plans and make it easier for the small utilities to uh, to develop those plans. Yeah, I guess a harmonized format would be, would make the understanding of distribution plan easier for the different stakeholders and we have a question to Marion actually two questions for Marion um, from the, the Commission the first one is um, whether um, the Commission plan to prepare some guidelines for NRAs on the implementation of the requirement of network planning for network planning and the second one is uh, how the Commission envisaged to increase network planning and development coordination between energy uh, between DSOs and energy network a distribution network. It's uh, the question. It if you want. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, no, no, no. I, I've seen the question. I was trying to unmute myself. Um, so on the first question on the on the guidance for the network development plans, we don't foresee uh, actually such uh, such guidance. So that's a pretty uh, straightforward answer. Uh, of course, uh, we have been in discussion with the different member states uh, for the implementation of the clean energy package, and we continue to have this, uh, this bilateral discussion with them as well. Um, now, for the uh, further integration and cooperation um, between the, the, the DSOs and, and across uh, energy carriers, I guess that was, that was the question. And I think it's a very timely question as well in terms of uh, what? So we have the clean energy package, uh, which looks at the electric sector, fostering cooperation between DSO and TSO. But now we also have uh, in the new, uh, let's say, policy and upcoming legislative framework, we have the Green Deal. And as part of that, we have the energy system integration, which uh, wants to also build a more integrated energy system across the energy carriers, so be it electricity, gas, heat, and also to have more integration between the different end users. So you have uh, 
the, the, the heating and cooling sectors, the industries, the building. And in this strategy, we, are, we already uh, hinted at the need to have uh, more uh, cooperation at planning level um, of the distribution system. And that will be follow up, followed up as well by, uh, by uh, legislative proposals uh, in the course of next year. And that is indeed something that uh, we want to look at as well, how to better uh, plan uh, in an integrated way at distribution level also in between the, the different energy carriers. So the question was referring to electricity and gas, but I would also add uh, heat as well in that. Can I just, support, you, us, can I just yeah. support us for one second, very short. Maya, I really support what you said because we see this that we only talk for the moment about seconds and minutes storage because that's what we mainly, or maybe an hour or so, that's what we mainly need for electricity networks. But if we want to really decarbonize and move forward, we need to talk about sector integration, meaning energy storage in form of gas, energy storage in form of heat, underground heat storage. We need to store huge quantities of energy, huge quantities in order to balance your system. And we are not aware, a lot of people are not aware of this, that if you go to a renewable system where the sun is more shining in the summer, obviously, when the wind is more blowing, when there's a temperature difference in the air, then you need to have a seasonal balancing coming on. And there we talk to power to guys, power to heat and, and the regulated storage about the heat and the, and the gases. So it's very important to look at both parts. Thank you, Patrick. I think we cannot have a webinar on a storage or on distribution planning without going to the network tariff question. And we had this uh, question 40, if you can, could see it, it's um, which network uh, tariff energy storage devices should pay and um, whether it should be treated as a consumer or as a producer or both. Any candidate for this question? I can... Yeah. I if I start again, uh, of course both. And uh, it sounds a bit uh, unfair, but still, because uh, the capacity of DSO grid or any other grid is uh, depending on time. So it's a different capacity in different times. So, so of course you have to pay according to the uh, capacity need the battery is, is, is needed and that's why it's a different uh, price for consuming or feeding in and then producing or feeding out that is uh, my opinion luca you wanted to comment we only have three minutes left in this session so briefly maybe luca and jorma if you have uh, your experience on this extremely short i want to recall that acer is uh, going to produce uh, and publish a report on distribution network tariff overall uh, europe uh, i we are working on that it's a very interesting report and also the issue of storage will be treated uh, just to say in italy um, the the tariff for the, the storage is aligned with the tariff for network users. In Italy, uh, generators do not pay network tariff, and therefore, if the storage behaves as a generator, that means emits energy in the network, it does not pay uh, network tariff. But if it behaves only as a consumer, uh, because, for instance, it's used for peak shaving, it, it, it must pay as a, as a passive consumer. The, the rule is simple. Uh, Jorma, can you tell us how is the case in Finland? Yeah, I, I just mentioned in my presentation this uh, pilot project with uh, Fortum, uh, who actually owns and operates the battery storage as, as such. So for Elenia, for, for the distribution network, it's a DC connection which we have in, in the network. And uh, we have actually uh, developed a specific uh, tariff uh, for this pilot installation, but of course we will now, you know, uh, further elaborate that uh, if needed, and, and uh, let's say keep in mind uh, various uh, alternatives for that. So I, I think the market will will further uh, develop around this. Arte, can I have 20 seconds? Just I know we need to stop. I just want to say two points. First of all, we need to differentiate between taxes for consumption, which should never be paid twice, and we should all agree on this. And this is separate from the network tariffs. So first principle, 
a kilowatt hour is consumed once, should be taxed once for consumption. So second, the network tariffs. I believe it's important, as Kenneth also said, the cap different capacity, different times important. So if with my energy storage system, I support the system, I reduce the stress and the congestion in the system by charging, why should I pay to support the system? And why should I pay to relieve congestion? Maybe you should use also to look at the services and the grid congestion and how it is and at what moment you charge when you define if storage needs to pay or not and once or twice. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. I guess we arrived uh, perfectly on time to the end of this session. That was uh, very interesting and I hope uh, it was we tried to op uh, to respond to the different questions we received from the audience. Uh, now I would like to pass say, the mic to Veli Pekka. I guess, Veli, we heard that there is no guidelines planned for NRA and on the implementation of the distribution planning and uh, network uh, plans and we also uh, got this last question with are asking whether there is a plan to develop an advice to national nra dealing with distribution network plans i guess you may have some information or news about that perhaps not news but i will try to try to address that so first of all thank you all all the <clears throat> participants and of course, our, our speakers and panelists and, and, and Athir as well for moderating. Thank you very much. We had quite an interesting discussion within the, within the two hour time limit. So I think we had something still to work on. We had some questions we didn't have time to address too. So we will, as, as a distribution system working group, try to summarize some of those, those issues asked on those questions and try to try to put in them to our, our summary. Okay, the next steps I would like to say that of course we are all aware of the national implementations of the energy package, especially on the article 32 relating to renew uh, <laughs> flexibility especially and then the network development plans. And of course as we all know the cases that uh, renewables are connecting now to the lower level where the DSOs are operating, so they will have more more challenges with the system operations issues as well. So that's of course something that we are very very keen to see. And I, I think that the, the distribution network development plans are the key issue to to make it more public, more discussable. They will have to address the users of the network, consumers, and all that. I mean the DSO. So that will make it more. Uh, transparent in that sense that we will know what what will happen in the near future, and of course when we have the legislation in place, we, we, we are really keen to see what kind of requirements there will be for the NRAs and as well to the DSOs. So that will be something to see, and of course we are very keen to as a, as a distribution system working group to see the first EU-wide development plans to see and to check what, what kind of information they can give and perhaps give a report on that. But of course, we will we will continue work on the issue uh, within the working group, of course, with the uh, EU, EU stakeholders as well. When whenever we have the challenge, the chance to to cooperate and, and have a discussion. So our our steps next steps are as as a working group, we will we will work on on the development plans uh, next year. We will write a short paper on on the on the issue. First of all, we will use the output of this discussion we had today. That's that's the key element for the for the paper. And of course, we we will see, as I mentioned, the development plans when they, the the legislation is implemented. What kind of key elements and requirements we will uh, receive on that, and we will report that uh, uh, next year sometime. We perhaps uh, early autumn will be our our call for the moment. So with that, I really want to thank you all. We had a great number of attendees participating in our webinar. Thank you for that. And once more, thank you for all our panelists and, and presenters. Thank you. Thanks a lot. That was great. Thank you. Yes, goodbye, everyone. Goodbye. Uh, thank, you. thank you very goodbye. Thank, thank you, you very goodbye. much. Bye. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.